Tell Me More podcast is being recorded on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. Today we are joined by the iconic Emma Watkins, formerly known as Emma Wiggle and more recently known as Emma Memma. Emma is a singer, dancer, filmmaker and is fluent in French and Auslan. And combining all of these wonderful passions, she has completed a PhD in sign language, dance and film. My name is Olivia Molly Rogers and I'm excited to get comfortable in the uncomfortable with you and remind you that nobody is perfect and everybody has something going on behind the scenes that you may not know about. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me, Emma. I'm so excited to have you here today. My niece, Winnie, is almost three years old and she's one of your biggest fans. Oh. I love the name Winnie, so hi, Winnie. <laughs> I actually might get you to do, give her a little yeah. proper shout-out eventually because she will probably pass out in a positive way. She's such a big fan, as am I. We are both proud ambassadors for the Witchery White Shirt campaign, which launches today, 16th of April, and it's their 16th year running. 16 um, years. 16 Isn't that years. incredible? It is incredible. So they support the OCRF, the Ovarian Cancer Research Foundation, and raise vital funds for research for an early detection test, which we still currently don't have. And it's a time. Been, it's a real time. It is. You've been on board for how many years now? Three years and, you know, have met so many amazing people as part of the OCRF and, of course, the team behind a lot of the research. Uh, and I think seeing people change and, of course, goals changing and growing and trying to find the right way forward is amazing. But, of course, even in the last 10 years, the OCRF have achieved quite a lot of progress. They have, definitely. And... People can get involved by purchasing a gorgeous white shirt. Uh, This year they've got two options. There's a cropped version and a long version. Um, We are nodding to the campaign by wearing white shirts, but these aren't the actual white shirts because they're they're secret until today. We didn't want to give it away. We do. Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't want to give it away. away. We we want that surprise to hang for everybody, and yes. then you'll have to go and check out Witchery yourself and yes, find exactly the white right. shirt, which we will also <laughs> be doing. Now, I I have so many things I want to ask you about. You go. are so interesting, and I already knew that, but then delving in and doing my research into who Emma Memma or Emma Wiggle is, um, there is just so much to you. Uh, I would love to take you back to the early days of your career. So I understand that you were a ballerina from a very young age and then went on to study dance and performing arts. Where did you see your career heading and what was the ultimate goal at that point in time? I guess as a child, I always wanted to be a dancer and I I knew that that was going to happen. I guess in my mind, there wasn't really another option, but Mm -hmm. I had a really interesting time. I had the most beautiful years at school, particularly my high school, which was a performing arts school, McDonald College. And during that time, you know, being able to do performing arts as well as your schoolwork at the same time in the same day was just a dream. And I didn't think I'd do anything else. And I had a really bad dance injury during my time at school, which actually forced me to leave performing arts and then the teachers didn't know what to do with me so for a long time because I was quite injured it was over 10 months so you can imagine being in year 10 and you know not wanting to upset anybody and wanting to dance as your your entire life um, they moved me to the kindergarten class and I would read stories to the kindergarten so I think actually that was quite formative for me because it's something Mm. that I really love to do and hence then through that time because I couldn't dance, I couldn't really move at all, I was shuffled into the art department, which had some amazing Apple computers. And at the time, they were the really beautiful ones that had the coloured backs, you know, the old Macs with the different colours. And my art teacher and I decided that I was just going to hang there. And I taught myself how to film edit, I guess, at the time. And then that kind of led one thing into the other and I joined a film competition and got a scholarship to Sydney Film School and then I started studying film. That's amazing. You have so many different talents and passions and I feel like you've done a really 
good job of combining them all. And it's almost like becoming Emma Wiggle was always in your, like it was always part of your destiny. Can you tell me how that actually came about? Yeah, I think you're right, Olivia. And, you know, I I feel like I'm 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 very open to learning lots of different things. I might not be very good at them, but very oh, happy to are. learn different bits and pieces because you never know where it's going to take you. I was yeah. teaching dance and I was at uni studying film and technology and moved to UTS and was doing my master's there and had received an audition notice for the Wiggles, which was a ballet audition. I thought that's pretty self-explanatory. And the, the casting said, you know, this is for a fairy role. And I was like, oh, that's me. I can do that. I've got fairy-like hair off. I pop. So I did that. And then I, I got the role. And so from there, I was teaching pretty much part time every single day of the week at a dance school, um, 85 International. And I was teaching lots of little children, you know, around the ages of about four to seven um, mm-hmm. and a few senior classes. And then I was going to uni and then I was touring with the Wiggles with Dorothy the Dinosaur Show and with the Wiggles, but on and off. So that kind of happened for about six to eight months before I was integrated into full-time wiggling. And what? Full-time wiggling, I love that. <laughs> I know, I just made that up. I don't think that's the time. <laughs> We're going to hold on to that. <laughs> so when your full-time wiggling started, what was your role? Mm. Well, I was a, a wiggly dancer at the time, so I was dancing around on stage. I was doing Dorothy the Dinosaur and Wags the Dog and Henry the Octopus and essentially just doing as much as I could. And I learnt to play lots of different instruments and I guess I... I really love to play drums because I had grown up doing Irish dancing and love rhythm. So it felt like something that was, uh, I guess, aligned to me. I I can't really play guitar, um, but my husband's an amazing guitarist. I try to play bass, but I'm still not that amazing. (laughs) I mean, I'll give it a go, but I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a, an intelligent guitar player. (laughs) You have enough skills, I think. I think we could probably <laughs> cap it. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, we could just, again, it's very like a general, a general broad, like happy to try everything. That's amazing. So you were all sorts of things for the Wiggles mm. before you actually became Emma Wiggle or the yeah. Yellow Wiggle. Can you tell me about the day that that conversation happened? Well, it was before a show at Enmore Theatre in Sydney and uh, Anthony approached me and I thought at the time it was a joke, um, but then that quickly turned into something very real <laughs> and really the announcement of that changed over time. So it was going to be held for a couple of months and they were going to announce the retirement of the original Wiggles and, you know, I just was so happy to be on the road with the original Wiggles and learning from them and learning the way that they write music and perform for children and what language they use. And so I had a such a beautiful time on the road at that point because I had learned so much. So it was was essentially a year apprenticeship and some of that apprenticeship wasn't really known to me. It wasn't very serious because I didn't think any, I just assumed that I was on the road as a dancer. But then when Mm. I knew that I was going to be you know, taking on the role of the Yellow Wiggle, I thought, oh, I actually really need to pay attention and and just loved it and had such a beautiful time, nine years as the Yellow Wiggle. I mean, it's it seems so bizarre when I think back and how young I must have been but have loved mm. all of the experiences. It was such an enormous thing for them to mm. go from four male members to incorporating a woman How did it feel? Like, I'm sure that there were positive aspects, but it must have been a lot of pressure to step into that role. I think there's always pressure when you're trying to do the best for something that's already such a nostalgic part of people's childhoods. Mm. And so I think that enormous pressure was about the responsibility of being uh, a children's entertainer that could be amongst a group that would provide quality children's entertainment. And so that was a lot to take on. Mm. But the fuss about being a girl, you know, I could never really understand it. And, you know, now nobody would bat an eyelid. So you mm. know, I think from from 2013 or 2012 it was announced to now 24, you know, that conversation is so different. Um, yeah. And, you know, it should It probably should never have been such a big deal. So, uh, you know, at the time, of course, because the context of the group was that it was, you know, four teachers from Macquarie Uni. um, I mean, three of them were teaching at the time. And, you know, I think they're 
they're great foundation in early childhood development and learning really, you know, head off the Wiggles being such a fantastic thing for children's music around the world. And so, um, yeah, when I came on board alongside Lockie and Simon, you know, we had all of that as well as being new and the group hadn't changed yet. Whereas now, you know, people are so much more flexible to people changing roles and careers and, and even yeah. colours. Yeah, definitely. It would have been, I actually can't even imagine stepping into a role like that when it had yeah. been so successful as they were. I think some people listening might not even understand the enormity of the Wiggles and what that looks like overseas and, you know, across the world. It's huge. Can you talk me through that a little bit, like what that looks like when you're on tour, you know, performing to sold out theatres of screaming little fans <laughs> what's it like well we had a beautiful time performing and you know of course the the members of the group before me had an amazing run over in the states and you know being on the disney channel and being able to perform to lots of families all across the world was such a big part of what the wiggles do and still do now and really it's just amazing that music and story and you know bits of Australian education can translate into other uh, countries and, and schools and preschools. And I think now we see the huge, I guess, change of of the way media is presented with digital technology and so many different platforms. But now you can see that through Bluey and what mm. Bluey has done to transcend the audience just from being very uh, local and, you know, from Brisbane and this is what Brisbane houses might look like and, you know, I think being able to construct that neighbourhood and then translate that onto screen and then for the future. I mean, now we're, we're, we're in the phenomenon of Bluey and it is so nice to see that so much beautiful Australian children's content is being loved across the world. Do you feel pressure... Like obviously stepping onto the stage in front of all of these kids, you can see the impact that your presence has. Do you feel pressure as a role model to so many young people? I guess now I perform as Emma Mimmer and, yeah. you know, our goal is to provide accessible children's media, not just to Australian children, but children everywhere. And I think when you go out on stage and you see all these beautiful little faces looking at you, they're so excited, they're ready to have a party. So you really can't not join the party. And so mm. it just makes life performing so lovely. And whether that's on a stage or whether that's in a library or a preschool, you know, every single opportunity is a moment to connect with those children. And really over the last two years, we've visited so many libraries and preschools and it's just lovely to be able to be in their school or in their setting and, you know, reading a book together or doing a dance and understanding where they are and what questions they want to ask or statements they want to tell you. Yeah. Like, Emma, I love your dress and why do you wear that? <laughs> I love the phenomenon that is uh, Emma bows. That <laughs> is incredible. My niece, every time she puts a bow on, it's an Emma bow. Beautiful. No matter what, which is very cute. Um, it must be wild seeing that impact that you have and how wild, widespread it is. I I read somewhere that you were described as the Elvis of the Wiggles because – once you came on board and everyone was so excited by Emma Wiggle, it was sometimes like 60 to 80% of the audience would be in yellow. Like was, I read that the guys were... There was a were, lot of dress-ups. There were yeah. a lot of dress-ups. And, you know, again, I think being in that realm of children's entertainment, you get to see the audience participation. And I think really on a totally different scale, you see that at Taylor Swift and you see everybody mm. from all different ages being able to be part of that experience by dressing up or making friendship bracelets. And that connection between the audience and the performer is really important. And so I guess for us, we see that in dress ups. And sometimes it's not always the color that you're wearing. It might be a frozen dress, like an Elsa dress with mm. an MMM butterfly in their hair. And, you know, all those different combinations mean something for that child. And so we just love seeing the dress ups at the show because there's so many different hybrids of things. Yeah, it's awesome. Did you, you know, going from being a dancer but being sort of more behind the scenes mm. and then being launched into being one of the the main characters, I suppose. Um, how did you feel suddenly having your face everywhere? Like 
I understand, you know, from my personal experience, it's weird going um, from, yeah, having none of that to suddenly having photos taken of you that you might not like and then they get plastered everywhere and and kind of having to, yeah, deal with just seeing your face in so many different ways. Um, did you ever struggle with that or body image at all across the journey? Uh, no, I think more for me it's a good laugh now because I just don't know why people are that interested and I'm not very interesting. So, you know, most of the photos that get taken of me that are unknowing um, are fairly boring, <laughs> trying to make a story out of absolutely nothing and, you know, mm. everybody kind of uh, can understand, you know, how the media is, is different and, you know, more relentless, you know, as the time goes on. But, yeah. you know, again, we are so fortunate to be in children's entertainment that most of the media around us is actually really lovely and when we meet people out and about you know you're you're mostly conversing with stories with parents or grandparents about their children or their grandchildren and that that connection is much more I want I don't want to say authentic but there's a you know we're so lucky to be ourselves as children's entertainers Mm. as opposed to playing a role um, and I think that's something that's really lovely. But yes, of course, the media does what the media wants to do. <laughs> they're yeah. their own, they're their own thing. They are. They're a bit of a beast. Yeah, I think when you have comes... to laugh at it. Oh, because yeah. What else can you do? Oh no, definitely. Where do they? Where? Do they, where how did they come up with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be very entertaining. Some of the yeah. headlines, that's for sure. Most of them get snapshot by my mum. And she sends them to the family chat. And, you know, I think it's funny because you see the kind of demographic that is drawn to that kind of media. And so when it comes through my mum, it took years for my mum to understand that none of that actually came from me. Uh, and so when she would find out stories, she'd be like, did you did you do this? Or were you in this airport? Or where were you going? And I'm like, mum. <laughs> they're just taking random photos and they're putting other headlines on it. But, you know, it, it makes you realise that, uh, it's there. There's so much of that that's really hard to decipher what's authentic and what's not. Yeah, definitely. It's funny you could be having a conversation with your mum and she'll know the truth, and then she can yeah still think something else based off of that. Yeah, like um, did I just hear a cat? Oh. We have we have quite a lot of animals. Cats, I have heard that. Can you talk dogs. me through your your animal collection? We we have moved south of Sydney to the country and mm-hmm. uh, we are able to record all of our music at home for Emma Memma and that's what we love to do. And I guess we're inspired by a lot of the wildlife around here. So in Robertson in southern New South Wales in the in the southern highlands, we have a lot of wombats. Uh, and so one of the characters in there is in Emma Memma is a wombat. Um, but right now you might hear uh, the sounds of cats. Uh, there's mm-hmm. dogs out there, goats. Some horses, chickens, the rabbit doesn't make much noise. Um, and the wombats are fairly quiet, unless at night. That's amazing. I did read somewhere that you, um, a big part of the reason you felt the the push to transition away from the Wiggles and to do your own thing was the want to be home more because you were touring so much. Is Is that right? Look, I think there were so many contributing factors. And at the time, through the pandemic, so much had changed. You know, we weren't actually doing a lot of touring and being able to catch up with family, even online, was actually so nice. And we have two little nephews that live in a different state to us. So being able to see them has been so nice. But also really at the time, because we weren't traveling and we weren't performing I had had more time to finish my PhD research and Mm -hmm. that project had kind of been going parallel, um, you know, alongside my time during the Wiggles anyway, as as all of my study was. Um, And I think I just became infatuated with figuring out or, or trying to research more about sign language and what that meant for Australia and what does the Australian deaf community look like and how are we integrating sign language better into our media. And at the time, because everything was online, I was doing my Auslan course online as well. And then that just kind of delved even deeper. And my mentor and I, uh, my mentor at uni, we were just like this, I think this is the time this is the time to finish this Mm. research now. So, yeah, I left the Wiggles to try and finish the PhD, which the work is done, Um, as in it's done for now. It's Thank you. It's very hard to draw a line on any PhD. And 
the problem is, is that because once you get so far in, then more research comes out and you want to do more things. And I guess you can see why people just keep going. Mm. I think for us, most of the research that we've been looking into in the last two years in particular has resulted in our children's character, Emma Memma, and the way that we do lots of our work. So, you know, right now I don't exclusively do Emma Memma, but I mostly connect with other businesses and work at how they can connect with men members of the deaf community and deaf talent in Australia and overseas. And yeah, we just do so many different things now. It's wonderful. Where did your passion for Auslan and and the deaf community come from? At primary school, my friend at school, her two brothers are deaf. And so we would play with each other after school all the time. So I think at the time I was in year two, year one or year two. So her brothers were younger. They were about seven years old and 10 or seven and nine. And we used to play all the time. So my mum would either pick up my sister and I and my friend and then bring them to my friend's house because the boys were at a different school. And, you know, I think that just inspired so much in me because we were so used to playing with each other and that communication was all visual that I think from that point on I really wanted to know more. Sadly I toured so much that I never got to do my course but then Mm. in the pandemic it changed to be online so then everything changed from there. Yeah and so your PhD specifically can you talk me through what what you did? So the title of my PhD is called Creative Integration of Sign Language, Film Editing for Children's Screen Media. Um, It's very specific (laughs) to Australia. Um, And all PhDs kind of, I guess, start, or maybe not all, but definitely mine was like a huge, there's so many things that I wanted to know. And then over time, it became more um, focused. Um, Mm -hmm. Even now, I think there's so much more we could do. But uh, we will be taking those learnings and putting them into MMM fairly soon. But there's so much for us to understand in children's media about the way in which children acquire knowledge through what they're seeing and what they're hearing. And I guess being part of a musical enterprise for so long and so loving dance, that really has changed the way that my husband and I have created Emma Memo and the world around it to be are completely different to how children's media is presented. And I think we're only just getting started. Definitely. I think it's sad that it's um, it's quite a foreign concept still. Mm. Um, it's, it's more foreign in Australia. In other countries, yeah. it's not as foreign. Um, so we have a lot of work to do in Australia. And I, it just feels like that children's entertainment is the best vehicle for us to create these pathways for people to feel safe enough and comfortable enough to learn some sign language and that it's actually quite fun. Yeah. Oh, I know from my speech pathology practice, I'm, I'm not practicing now, but when I was just how mm. beneficial some signs can be in yeah. helping children to learn the words alongside the signs. Why do you think accessibility is so important in children's entertainment? I think for us at this very early preschool level, lots of children may not be using spoken language anyway. Uh, Whilst they might be hearing it, if they can hear, uh, they might be acquiring that knowledge through what they're listening from their parents or from people around them. For a child to be able to express themselves, mostly before they use spoken language, if that's their pathway, they'll use visual language. So whether they're pointing to something or pointing to themselves or pointing to mum or dad. And so that use of visual language is already inherent in so many children Mm. and for parents as well. Parents, guardians, carers, teachers, everyone, educators, everyone uses visual language. So how can we use that more when we are presenting something that's entertaining? And so music and dance, whilst it's very creative, how can we integrate the foundations of sign language so that what we're presenting on screen actually has some real meaning and some real value? Yeah, that's so good. It's so impressive what you're doing in that space. Um, Well, I mean, we're only a tiny company, but I also am so inspired by some of the deaf teachers that I've had over the years and deaf artists. And my co-performer, Elvin Lamb, is profoundly deaf. And 
Honestly, the things that I learned from Elvin and our deaf consultant Sue daily are outrageous. These are people that are already in our country, already using techniques like this. It's just that we don't know about it. And so, you know, there's so much that we as a society, as a collective society, that can be learning from others because of their experience. And so I guess inclusion has a lot of different uh, contexts and a, and a lot of different connotations, but really it's we just need to do more about taking in knowledge from other people and how can we make the pathways of whether that's media or education or learning a little bit more integrated than they already are. What do you think people from the hearing community can do on a day-to-day basis to be a bit more inclusive? I think you know, it's sort of one of those out of sight, out of mind things where if you don't know someone who is deaf or who is close to someone who is deaf, it's probably not something that you think about. So when they see, you know, people who are signing, whether it is in children's entertainment or when a politician is speaking or whatever it may be, it feels so foreign to them. Can you, Mm. yeah, maybe give some pointers on how people can be a bit more inclusive? I think my experience in children's entertainment has really led me to believe, and and probably in your profession as a speech pathologist, knowing that uh, children don't necessarily need to have a hearing loss to use sign language, and it's Mm. so common and it's so beneficial, (laughs) and not just for the child uh, that might be on the autism spectrum or maybe nonverbal. A child might still be able to hear you but would like to express himself in visual language instead. And so there's so many different facets of visual language that could be useful not just for children but even for adults. And Mm. so it really is about how do people acquire knowledge the best way And because we live in a very fairly visual world, I'm sure that if we could integrate better visual foundations in any of our media, that would be really helpful. I mean, one of the things that we tend to think about is captions, and captions are generally in this country are in English. But for somebody that's learnt sign language or their first language is Auslan, Australian Sign Language, they their English proficiency might not be as amazing as Auslan and so then they're having to use a second language to read those captions constantly, which is tiring. And that's the kind of thing that we just, like you mentioned, Olivia, it may not be around us because we take it for granted, which is called yeah. a hearing privilege. And so really we could probably do a lot more. And I feel that for us as a hearing community, we have the ability to learn sign language and to hear language. So really... We have the upper hand and mm. we should be able to learn sign language as other people. So I think it would be lovely if everyone could start to learn some sign language. And for me, it's always been, I don't know what it is, but I always think about being in an emergency situation where somebody might not be able to hear. And mm. we have a natural, not a natural, sorry, that's probably the wrong term, but there is a lot of... uh rules and regulations about going to somebody in an emergency and squeezing their shoulders and asking them, are you okay? (laughs) But if that person doesn't speak English um, or has a hearing loss and didn't understand what you said in English, um, you know, how can we best describe that through our body? And I feel that that's a skill that everyone should have. And I feel that it is weird at this point in time that we don't have another alternative. Um, Of course, there are some amazing organisations that actually do have an alternative. But in terms of general knowledge across our country, we don't. Yeah, that is a really good point. And it's not something that I've thought about. I mean, and like you say, you might not have been in that situation. Um, But it could be anything. It could even be at the shops. And somebody may have a hearing loss and use a sign language and someone's yelling at them to get out of the way, but they don't see it. And it's like, if anyone had the skills to go, oh, okay, I recognize that person needs a few visual cues, then here's a bit of sign. Are you okay? Do you need help? Do you need support? Oh, can I, you know, assist with that? Like, that would be great. But when we are not even at that level here in Australia and other countries aren't too, but there is different understandings across the world and so many learnings that we can integrate here. Definitely. Um, so sorry. all adults need to watch Emma Memma as well. Why are you saying sorry? <laughs> Don't get me started. I no, mean, this, I love this, it. <laughs> this is why I love so how passionate. passionate you are. It's great. I mean, I, and, I haven't I mean, figured it out. I don't. I don't know what that solution is yet. I don't know what the best solution is. Um, but, I mean, I think it all starts with conversations, right? Yeah. Getting more people to think about it. 
is and a good in, start. Yeah, and the only way that we, you know, as a tiny independent company can uh, present this these findings and at least some services and, and knowledge for families is through children's entertainment because that's what we know really well. And so how can we empower children and their family network to know a few signs like, hello, how are you? Thank you, please. Mm. Those are very simple, but um, even that is not known across the board yet. Yeah. There's a lot of work to do, for sure. A lot, which is why we're so busy. Yes. (laughs) Now, I want to take you back a little bit. Something that obviously comes up a lot, and I know it's kind of annoying because I have a similar thing where people just want to talk about your relationships. Um, (laughs) And it's not the most interesting thing about you by any means. Um, But we do have a similar experience in that we were both previously married. Um, Yours longer than mine. Mine was only seven months, but yours was a couple of years. It's okay. It's fine. Um, I would love to know, though, that must have been really difficult to navigate, being married to someone that you're working with, going through a marriage breakdown and continuing to work alongside each other. How did you navigate that time? Well, look, I actually think that Lockie and I were super lucky because we have been the best friends always, like from the start even to now. And so for me, being able to actually be with Lockie and work and, you know, navigate that together was actually fine. (laughs) And I think, you know, again, most of the time, you know, media would try and figure out why or, you know, what went wrong. But really for Lockie and I, we re- we realised that we were just the best of friends. And if I didn't have Lockie through that whole time that we were becoming Wiggles, I mean, again, we were so young and we went through yeah. all of those experiences together. You know, we had each other's backs and still do now. And I think that support for each other is something that we carry through and yeah you can ask Lockie too but uh it's the same kind it's a mutual understanding and you know we recognize that our friendship was so important and it actually helped us get through that's amazing I guess there would have been something really beneficial about being together yeah you have to when you know everyone else is saying stuff that's not true and you are there knowing the facts we're like, okay, that, I mean, obviously there's always speculation about anyone's mm. situation, but again, people didn't really know, you know, people don't know about other people's, um, you know, deep contexts. And it's always something to keep in mind about not actually knowing what people are going through. And I feel like it's, again, it's just, it's not appropriate. <laughs> mm. And, you know, I think on on the front though, I, like I mentioned before, Lockie and I, we were, we loved, you know, being part of the Wiggles and, and doing what we do best. And, you know, it's the way that we grew. We honestly had the best apprenticeship of so many things, of learning mm. how to be a performer, learning how to be best mates, learning how to be married and not, um, and actually developing a career. I mean, we, we are so fortunate. Yeah. I mean, you definitely do learn through those big life Always. experiences. Yeah. Um, how did you then, though, moving forward, open yourself up again for relationships? I think this is something that people ask me a lot, um, you know, moving forward after something like that happening and then having to navigate it publicly. How did you get to a point where you felt like you were open to loving again and you obviously met your beautiful husband and and got remarried can you talk about that for me I guess you know as we mentioned before the media will will always um, play a different story and you know when you know that you're true to yourself and true to each other you know that and that Lockie and I knew exactly what was going on and we knew we were the best of friends and that we would support each other for life Mm. I think that just then everything goes away (laughs) you know it wasn't really the forefront of our purpose and Again, we were doing a job we needed to be able to bring joy to children and we loved doing it. And so it was a fairly um, practical process. And yeah. I guess through that, you know, once we had worked out where we were, you know, personally and individually in our own lives, um, you know, Lockie found his beautiful wife, Dana, who I got to film with at the time, who's like one of the most beautiful dancers in Australia of all time. And, you know, everything just 
kind of felt right. It was like we had to have that moment together in order to find out who our true soulmates were. And, Mm. you know, then, of course, I found Ollie and Ollie was writing lots of music for the Wiggles at the time and is an incredible musician. And since we've been able to combine our powers and create music and families for people here and beyond. Yeah, that's awesome. How did you navigate, you know, making that decision with Lockie to end the relationship? Because I think it's it's really brave no matter what the situation is, but also, you know, people were invested, like you were working together and it was, you know, I'm sure that they were rooting for you as a couple to make that decision. I think sometimes it it is the easier option to stay in it for, for the sake of, you know, keeping up appearances or or whatever that may be. Um, and it's really brave to be like, no, actually, this isn't serving us completely. We're going to take the other path. How well, did look, you make that decision? I think, again, just being able to be really open and honest with everybody. And because people then recognise that we were still friends and still are, mm. then that was kind of the end of the story. You know, there was yeah. if there was nothing to really talk about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think, of course, if something dramatic had happened, um, you know, then th- those stories obviously spiral. But because there wasn't anything to do, because we still remain friends and we still work together, um, mm. people actually then were very uh, understanding of our friendship and how important that friendship really was. And and I like I truly mean it. We would never have been able to be in that position to be integrated into such a worldwide phenomenon company um, mm. and, you know, the 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 amount of shows that we were doing and touring, like we would never have done it without each other. You know, so, yeah. we're so grateful that we had each other at the time because we were both, yeah, in our early 20s. I mean, I started at the Wiggles before I was 20. So, you know, I was so young and I'm so glad that I had such a caring and understanding friend, um, you know, on so many levels, uh, which – yeah, again, I feel like has made our friendship even today. You mentioned before something about, you know, people delving into relationship questions. It's it's not appropriate. Similarly, uh, when it comes to fertility, mm. I can only imagine when you're, you know, bumping into or fans are coming up to you and parents are talking to you. I think it is unfortunately what people think they can ask or say to a woman at a certain of age. Of course. Do you want kids? When are you going to have kids? Oh, you'll be a great mum. Surely you want kids. Those kind of conversations. How do you navigate that? Because I know you've you've spoken, you are an ambassador for Endometriosis Australia as well, which is amazing. And you've spoken about that. How do you set boundaries between what you're willing to share when it comes to that side of things? Again, I'm really open yeah. <laughs> and also very transparent and because of the nature of the job you know, being in, in the public eye, but also in children's entertainment, there was no way that we could not um, be really honest with the public at the time when I was diagnosed and I needed to go for surgery. Yeah. Um, you know, it just made sense that we would just tell everybody that I'm, this is what's happening and I'm going to have a surgery as opposed to, um, you know, keeping it a secret and then people trying to ascertain whether I was pregnant or not because, of course, mm-hmm. a lot of people thought I was. And when we talked about the media before, that would happen with my mum all the time. It would be it would be printed in articles that I was pregnant and my mom would screenshot wow. it and go, didn't, why didn't you tell me? I'm like, I'm not, oh. <laughs> I'm actually not. And because it was so opposite, we obviously had to address it, but we never thought that it would spiral into the conversation that it was and is now. And mm. the fact, the very needed conversation, just like ovarian cancer, the endometriosis, ah, just so many people suffer this disease and people are battling these uh, symptoms all the time and it comes in so many different facets and so for me we you know when I had to announce to the public that I was going away for surgery um, it was like a barrage of 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 mums in particular uh, telling me and giving me support like it's okay I had children as well (laughs) that's so nice and I think for me I know that people aren't actually trying to pry you know when am Mm. I going to have a child or you know or you know those conversations before I was diagnosed or even after you know we still receive those questions but it's people just genuinely wanting to be interested 
And yeah. I think when your mindset changes, like it's okay. Like some people are just genuinely wanting to to um ask you in a supportive way as opposed to like trying to attack for other reasons. And so for me, you know, I'm I'm I love the support from the community yeah. because it, almost in every show that we perform in MMMA, I get to walk around the audience and you know, meet children and there's always a mum or an auntie or a cousin or a grandma like I had endo too and you know like that support is is everywhere yeah. and yeah. that makes you realize how widespread um and how many people are affected that's good that you feel that support from the community yeah I, I feel like you have this like beautiful way of putting a positive spin on everything which is well, Very impressive, and I wish I could do that like you do. But there's, there's is there I, I, ever it's a, a grumpy Emma? Does she exist? Oh, when I'm really hungry for chocolate, which my husband <laughs> will, will say. Uh, but it's not. I I think it's just a lot of the learning has you, you know you you don't know what people are going through, and so for some mm. people that question is actually not a, a um, interrogative question. So I can't ever assume that someone's asking that to me as an interrogation, where I think, you know, for so many people, and of course, if it's in an interview, it may be of an interrogative nature. But really, when we're out and about, people are genuinely asking because they feel connected to you. And when you're in children's households, being on TV or on YouTube or, you know, at part of their uh, music streaming and they're listening to you all the time, you know, parents and grandparents feel connected to you. And that's actually such a lovely thing. Yeah. But it's taken me years to get that in my brain too. You know, I probably would look at old interviews and, you know, I might be a bit more guarded. And, you know, you know, lots of female artists are very um, private about their own uh, you know, medical or fertility situation, which is fine. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think the more that the years have gone on, I've just recognized that, you know, people actually might not be interrogating me. They're just genuinely asking yeah. <laughs> and they're genuinely reaching out. And I think that, I think that the fact that people actually care is, is lovely. Yeah, that's really nice. I do think that it, it comes back to what we were saying before about, you know, accessibility and having conversations mm about fertility I think it it just helps people to think about the language that they're using which I think is yeah, really important. Yeah that's true I mean and again it's it's all about um talking about it more and yeah how does it not come across as an interrogative um question or a judgmental thing yeah well. I mean I've had yeah. I've had it all I've had yeah. so many hilarious interviews where yeah, it, yeah where the question it, you know comes a, may present itself as interrogative and you know I might hear from friends um, afterwards listening to interviews like, oh, why did why would they ask you that question? I'm like, yeah, but I don't actually think that was their intention. <laughs> I think, you know, when you when you actually look back and you reflect on it, most of the time it's not. <laughs> it may Good just have come though. I think you're you're being very kind. <laughs> but I mean what I mean what's the point? You know, like if yeah. if people are genuinely if you know, we've got to see good in people. Mm. We, and we do have such a beautiful community and the only way that this conversation and I know we're being really specific about endometriosis and ovarian cancer, but the more that people talk about it really overall, the better. Because when I was diagnosed, I can't remember anyone saying the word endometriosis to me ever. And yeah. since then, I hear it daily. So I'm just grateful that the conversation is there. Yeah, definitely. Awareness is mm. so important. Yeah. As it is with ovarian cancer. Yeah. And we know so much more about it. But again, I mean, really relishing in the enormity of what the OCRF and Witchery do and the partnership that they've created, which is what I guess um, got me when I first was approached to be part of the White Shirt campaign a few years ago. I was just so um, struck with how amazing the partnership was working together and how much awareness that they've created together for mm. ovarian cancer like it is amazing <laughs> what they do and I'm so thrilled that this campaign continues to thrive every single year yeah I think the thing that struck me when I first came on board was I just kind of assumed that when we got a pap smear that that was 
it. checking us for ovarian <laughs> cancer. And I think most people do assume that. Yeah. And then they were really, you know, honing in on the fact that there is no early detection test. Yeah. So usually if someone is going in for a check to see if they have ovarian cancer, which has to be surgery, mm. um, then they then find out that they have it. There's no sort of pre-warning and it's, it's no. awful. Yeah, and I, I guess, you know, one of the biggest parts of this discussion and has been for the last, you know, couple of decades is that the symptoms are so different in every person and along different scales, you know, at very early stages or even late stages. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't quite, uh, you know, we're not finding those symptoms early enough to make a change or to at mm. least intervene and help that person. And so, you know, one of the most amazing and extraordinary women I've ever met was through this campaign, uh, Leanne Flynn. And, uh, she, oh, she was so beautiful. Survived so many years, and she constantly talked about how to bring a positive angle to the conversation because it is so. It can be traumatic, um, and you know, being able to open the discussion. You know, as we said before, if it if it gets too um, dark then it's less likely to be talked about. So mm. I think what she did by absolutely championing like sunshine around everything that she did, I think it's something that we now have to pick up and follow because this is the very, you know, I, I guess we, we're we now responsible for carrying on her legacy um, in particular and others that have gone before her. Definitely. Now, Emma, I would love to finish up with a segment called Oranges and Lemons. Um, great. Do you love that I <laughs> don't start? know what the segment is and I'm so excited? Oh. <laughs> this is great. I feel like this is something that you could get behind, but I'm, oh I feel like you're probably going to struggle with a lemon because you're so positive. So <sighs> your lemon is something negative that may have happened today or over okay. the last couple of days. It can be oh. minor or it can be major, oh, and gosh. then your orange is something positive. So oh, well. we usually start with the lemon so we can finish with the positive. But you know me, I because I love the colour orange and I'm genuinely always wearing the colour orange with MMM, I'm going to go with orange a lot, but I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have a lemon, anything negative? It's not negative, but I've had my wisdom tooth oh, out. I would say that's negative. And it was a, that hurts. It was very pain. <laughs> it was very painful, and so hence my cheek isn't as smiley as it normally. So just one side. Is. Um, just one side, and that I would have to say that that was probably my lemon for the week. Yeah, that's a that's a. It's lemon. been a good week. It's been seven days, and it's still not smiling. <laughs> oh no! But that's okay. I mean, well, I didn't notice it. You still look good. very beautiful that's and good. smiley. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> And what That's about the orange? Um, look, to be honest, there's been a lot of oranges. Um, and March, the month that has just been, uh, has has proven so many beautiful moments. And I think with Emma Memma visiting, we visited schools and preschools and shopping centres from Victoria through Sydney and all the way up to Brisbane. And I think just getting very excited to see everybody again for our shows and like there's so much excitement for the new music that we brought out and that would have to be the orange. That's awesome. You are just one big orange. I love it. I'm a big um, orange and you are a big orange. There is Lots of orange juice. There's a there is a there is a historical story that um there was a community festival uh, many a year ago before I joined the Wiggles um, that had a mascot that was an orange mm -hmm. and I actually was that mascot for many years. <laughs> so I have a lot of connection with the colour orange and the fruit yeah. orange and everything orange is, it just feels like it is the right place to be. It's you. I love it that. Me. <laughs> my lemon is that I burnt my hand quite badly last night. I was <gasps> cooking dinner and my um, spatula was hanging over the pan a bit and, and I didn't realise. And I grabbed it with my whole hand and burnt that hand and then in my reaction I threw it to the my other, other hand. One. So everything's burnt. Um, so, so that's my lemon. But what's your orange? My orange has been talking to you. And oh, the do fact you that say that all the time? No. Well, oh, I, I mean, I'm <laughs> going mean, to offend I... people that I don't always say it, but I made a rule that I couldn't say that every time. But you, can't. you are an orange, so <laughs> how could it not be? And Thank also you. the fact that we are ambassadors for this amazing campaign yes. together 
which is the reason we were connected and exactly yeah I've enjoyed this so much and I could talk to you all day so I really Thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you so much, Emma. Thanks for having me, Andy. Yeah, we are only in the more beautiful years of this campaign as it starts to reach so many people. Um, I'm still so staggered by the amount of um, growth and knowledge that this campaign receives. And yeah, here's to another year. Yes, I love that. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Tell Me More. This show wouldn't be possible without you. If you'd like to show your support, please subscribe or follow the podcast on your favourite platforms and don't forget you can watch full episodes on YouTube and Spotify.